Okay, welcome to lecture number 22 for ECE 341 Random Processes, Markov Chains and Coronaviruses. Now the Markov Chains that we've been studying assume that there is no memory in the system, meaning that the next state, x of k plus 1, is simply a state transition matrix away from the present state, x of k. Now that simple assumption applies to more than just electric circuits. With that, you can do things like model disease spreads, as well as games of tennis and people tossing balls. Uh, what I want to do in this lecture is kind of show how markup chains can be used to model things like the coronavirus spread. Bit of a disclaimer. The models presented in this lecture are simply to show that the Markov chains that we're studying apply to more than just electric circuits or people tossing balls back and forth. They apply to other systems as well. You can use them to model the stock market. You can use them to model disease spreads. This is simply uh, showing how the Markov chains we're using can model something of current interest, the coronavirus. And I'm not going to claim that these models are better than those for the center disease controls. The model used here is extremely simplistic. But simplistic as it is, it still is fairly consistent with the more sophisticated models that the University of Washington and the CDC are coming up. Plus, it's kind of fun. You can sit there and analyze things other than just tennis matches. So what I want to do in this lecture is look at the coronavirus outbreak in 2020 and use what we know in this course to simulate that outbreak. And once to simulate it, ask questions such as, what impact does social distancing have on the disease spread? What impact does wearing masks have on the spread? What impact would a vaccine have? Say, if the time to recover from the coronavirus drops by a half or a fourth. And since we don't have any actual numbers for many of the parameters used in this lecture, we're going to take a scientific wild ass guess or swag at them. Um, kind of a sidelight. That's what swag stands for, scientific wild ass guess. So when people use swag for something else, I kind of raise an eyebrow. So to model this as a Markov chain, I'm going to group the people into four groups. And this is pretty common with infection uh, studies. The four groups are the healthy and uninfected people. These are people that have not caught the coronavirus and are susceptible to it. The infected people, people who have the coronavirus and can spread it. People who are cured, who have the coronavirus but have recovered. And the people who are dead. That's kind of self-explanatory. And to model this as a Markov chain, I'll say that the next state, one day in the future, is some state transition matrix times the present state. And also note, we're going to assume that cured and dead are absorbing states, meaning that once you're cured, you stay cured. Once you're dead, you stay dead. Uh, we're pretty sure that once you're dead, you stay dead. The cured is still an open question, but for this lecture, let's assume that's true. I'll come up with a couple definitions. Let n be the contact rate, the number of people you come in close contact with each day. p be the transmission rate, the probability that somebody will catch the disease if the healthy person comes in contact with an infected person. The cure rate, again, is kind of a wild guess. I'm going to assume 5%. The reason for that is it appears that about 20 days after catching the coronavirus, you're cured. Um, that means that you have history, and markup chains don't allow you to know more about the past than the present. So I'll model that by saying the cure rate is exponential in nature, so that the average cure time is 20 days. You know, the probability of being cured is 1 20th. Also assume the death rate is 1.4% of the cure rate. Again, the uh, World Health Organization estimates the worldwide death rate at 1.4%. So if 1.4% of the cure rate is the death rate, then most people will be cured, a few will die. So with those assumptions, I can now calculate the number of new infected people each day. The number of new infected people will be proportional to the number of infected people times the number of people they come in contact with, times the probability of transmitting the disease if you come in contact with them, times the probability that the person you come in contact with is infected, minus the number of people that are cured, minus the number of people that die. That's the increase in the number of people that are infected. Now let's group all this together and call it A. A is then is the number of people you come in contact with each day times the probability of infection times the percent of the people that are healthy. Percent 
probability that the person you come in contact with is healthy and susceptible. If I do that, then the number of cured people each day will be 5% of the number of infected people. The number of people who die each day will be 1.4% of the 5% of, of the number of people infected. It gives you this for the state transition matrix. And it's a little bit arbitrary how you do this. If you notice, delta i is i of k times h of k. I can either put a right here, so that's a function of h times i, or put it over here. Either way works. I'm going to put it in this fourth column. Uh, so what that says is that on any given day, I'll look at the number of infected people. It'll go up and down based upon the number of people that are healthy, based upon the number of people that are infected, and depending upon A. And A is also a function of H and I. So with that model, I can now start running some trends. Before I do that, though, I need to know what is A. Um, what is the number of people you come in contact with? What's the probability of infection? Uh, assuming I start out with a population which is mostly healthy, A is roughly n times p, and it really doesn't matter where or how you come up with np. All I care about is the product. Um, also, A determines the growth rate of the disease. The next value is going to be 1 plus A minus 5% cured minus 0 0.0007 uh, die. If this number is bigger than 1, the disease increases. If it's less than 1, it gets smaller and smaller. To figure out what A is, uh, let's look at some historical data. This is from Wikipedia. In the United States, the coronavirus started in February and started increasing exponentially. Then we had a national emergency, a lockdown, and the disease rate dropped. Let's look at the case right here. Looking at this initial slope, I can calculate what the growth rate is by finding that slope right there. Initially, the disease is spreading, increasing by tenfold every nine days, or doubling every three days. What that means is this growth rate. In nine days, it goes up by 10 times. In three days, it goes up by two times. With that, I can solve for A. A is about 0.34, meaning n times p is 0.34. Now, how you come up with that mathematically doesn't matter. For the study, let's just assume each person comes in contact with 10 people, meaning the probability of transmission is 3.48% for an NP of 0.348. Once I have that, I can now run the simulation. Let's give it an initial condition, say 700,000 people that are healthy. That's roughly the population in North Dakota. 100 people are infected as of March 1st. Let the simulation run, and this is what you get. On March 1st, pretty much everyone's healthy. April 1st, the infection rates are shooting up. Uh, May 1st, I've hit, I've hit the peak and starting to drop off. And so on. What's kind of surprising to me is that this is actually very similar to some of the models you see coming out of the Center of Disease Control in U University of Washington even with a fairly simplistic model. This model also tells you part of the reason we had the emergency and the shutdown of the university as well as the rest of the country on spring break. If this model continued, we would hit over 400,000 infected people in the state of North Dakota in early April. The hospitals could not handle it. If the hospitals get overwhelmed, then the death rate will shoot up. Um, so that's part of the reason we had the lockdown. And again, with this model, these are the numbers we're predicting. The peak would have been in mid-April. Mid 400,000 people would have been infected at one any given time. And about 9,600 people would die. That's 1.4% you know, using the, the death rate from the World Health Organization. Uh, while that model seems simplistic in, in the extreme, it does fairly well match up with the other more sophisticated models. It also kind of points out some of the problems and why we had a lockdown. The thing to note from this is that Markov chains are pretty useful. You can use them to model more than just electric circuits, and they also let you answer or ask various questions. Um, so if this is what we get based upon the world that we knew back on March 1st,
what would happen if I reduced n times p? Uh, suppose I increase social distancing so that instead of each person coming in contact with 10 people each day, I drop that by 3. And you could do that by self-isolating, closing schools, etc. Equivalently, since it's n times p, I could leave n alone and reduce p by 3 times, such as people start wearing face masks, um, and social self-isolation, social distancing would also work. We run the simulation and just drop n times p by factor 3. Here's what you get. The number of infected people goes from 420,000 down to about 130,000. You know, a huge drop, which is uh, much less of a drain or a strain on the hospitals. The peak, instead of coming in mid-April, gets pushed out by four and a half months. So that's March, April, May, June, July. About mid-July, early August would be the peak. And eventually the disease dissipates after 83,000 people, or leaving 83,000 people uninfected. And the death toll drops from about 10,000 down to about 7,000. That's if you reduce either term by three times. Let's ask another question. Suppose I do both. I do self-isolation, close schools, and etc. to reduce the number of people I come in contact with by three times. And let's also reduce the probability of infection by three times, but people start wearing masks, social distancing, and so on. By reducing n times p by nine times, what you wind up with is the infection rate actually drops below one. What that means is that the disease never spreads, it never takes hold. Instead of shooting up, it immediately starts dropping off. And here I give an initial condition that assume 100 people are infected initially, it goes away. So by doing both self isolation, and wearing masks, I can basically make the disease never happen. There is no, never a pandemic. Let's say ask a fourth question. Suppose we came up with a vaccine and for our, just for the sake of simulation, uh, suppose the vaccine says that instead of taking 20 days to, be, to recover from the disease, it only takes five days. What that means is the people that are infected are only infecting people for five days instead of 20. If I rerun the simulation with no change, n times p is 10, or n times p is 0.348, I still wind up with a slight outbreak, but it is much, much uh, less severe, but there's still an outbreak. You still wind up with, um, what, almost 500,000 people infected, 7,000 deaths, and a peak about two months out. Let's ask a fifth question. Suppose you had a vaccine that reduced the time it takes to recover from 20 days down to five, and you continue wearing masks so that n times p drops by three times. In that case, the infectivity rate drops below one and the disease just dissipates on its own. The final simulation, those are all you know hypotheticals, what if. Well, let's look at the world as of today. May 1st, 2020. Uh, this is the disease spread in the country. This is before we had national shutdown, isolation. This is afterwards. The disease is still increasing, but at lower rate. This right here tells you the new n times p. Uh, the new rate is the disease is doubling every 56 days rather than every three days. What that in calculate A is, if this in 56 days doubles, then it says A is 0 0.06. If I rerun the simulation so that N times P is 0 0.06, I wind up with this. Again, we still have a slight outbreak, much, much better than it was before. Um, I only have 3,000 dead rather than 10,000. And the maximum number of people ever infected in North Dakota would be 16,000. So that's the world as of May 1st. If we stayed in lockdown, uh, states did not open up, and so on, that's what we could expect. What's really going to happen remains to be seen. But the point of this lecture, again, is simply to say that Markov chains are useful. They model more than just electric circuits. And it's also kind of fun. 
With what we know right now, we can do things like simulate the coronavirus outbreak. And we can ask questions such as, what happens if you self-isolate? Why are people self-isolating? What happens if you wear masks? What happens if a vaccine gets, gets released? And based upon the current trends, uh, what can we expect? So again, as a disclaimer, this is not arguing that we know anything more than the Center of Disease Control or University of Washington or other people. This is just simply saying that Markov chains are kind of fun and they're useful. They let us ask questions to analyze systems more than just electric circuits. That's lecture number 22 for ECE 341, Random Processes.